right. Luke chapter 6, in verse 38, it says, give. Everyone say, give. give. Say it again. Give. Say it again. Give. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Our topic today is this, the revelation of giving. The revelation of giving. You may be seated. Mm. We have quoted this scripture many times. It's a powerful scripture. What we like about it is that the Lord is telling us that there is a reward that comes with giving. And of course, we apply this scripture oftentimes to our giving of offerings or our giving of tithes, but I want you to know it means much more than that. I believe today that in this scripture text that we will go through today, amen, we will get a revelation from God. You will receive a personal revelation from God about your giving. It's easy how we skip over, amen, the first word so often, but obviously in order for something to be given unto us, we must first do something, and that is to give. It says, give, and it shall be given unto you. And then it talks about the type of giving that will come back to us. Obviously, when we give toward God, toward his kingdom, God is always going to give us back more than we give. And he makes that point here and really describes, amen, the type of giving he will give back to us. But I want you to notice something before we can really dissect verse 38. We have to look up a little bit. And so let's start with verse 36. Jesus said, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. He says, judge not, not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Now we see that in verse 36, that God is a merciful God. He is a God that grants us mercy. But there is a principle here that Jesus, amen, is trying to teach us. He's saying that no matter what it is that you give, it's going to come back to you. So therefore, if you judge not, what you get back is not being judged. If you condemn not, what you get back is not being condemned. If you forgive, what you get back is being forgiven. This principle then, this biblical principle that the Lord is laying out here, then applies to all areas in our life. In other words, if you want compassion, then you give compassion. Amen. If you want someone to have patience with you, then you give patience. If you want help, then you give help. If you want an increase in your finances, then you give of your finances. Amen. If you want to receive greater wisdom and knowledge from God, then you give of the wisdom and knowledge that you have. If you want more time, then you give time. And he says then how you'll get it back is in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Notice he doesn't say you have to give in good measure, give it pressed down, give shaken together, or give running over, but he says that is what you will receive. Now Jesus is making a point here, and he's using terms that were relevant for his day. These terms or sayings of good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over are farming terms. And in the Old Testament, there were two kinds of farmers. 
And this would also apply to Jesus' day. But when an owner of a property or land was growing crops, when the harvest time came, he would have to hire workers to bring the harvest in. And he would pick two types of workers. The first type was the primary harvester. And the primary harvester was someone who worked the middle of the field because in the middle of the field was the greatest harvest. It would be where the greatest grain is or it would be much more thick and lush in the middle. Amen. And what these primary harvesters would do is that they would be paid, amen, either by the hour or by the day. There was a negotiated rate between the owner of the land and the primary harvester. And what they did is they harvested the field, but they were just working their time. They were just working the hour or working the day. The primary harvester then would have a bag or he would have a basket and he would harvest and he would fill up the basket and then he would take it over to a wagon or take it perhaps to a barn. He would empty the basket and he would come back to, amen, the place where he was harvesting and he would do this. And he would do this over and over all day long. But to him, because he was paid by the day or the hour, it really didn't matter how much grain he would put in the basket. Amen. He could put, amen, fill it up halfway or three quarters full, and he would take it and go on a little walk and dump it out, amen, and then come back and do it again because he was just working for time. But then there was another type of harvester that the owner of the land would pick, and these were usually people who had great need, amen, they were poor, and their payment would be, after they worked for a certain amount of time, they would get to take a basket of grain home. Now, because this basket of grain was necessary for them to feed themselves, to feed their family, and to last them some time, amen, they had a whole different motive when they filled their baskets. And so therefore, when it's time for payment to be made, they would take their basket and they would make sure the person pouring in the grain would give them a good measure of grain. But that wasn't enough. They would then take the basket and they would press it down. They would press it down all the way around the sides. Amen. And, and press it down in the middle. Amen. And they would press it down so that could, they could create more room for more grain. Then what they would do is they would shake it. And what the shaking did is it would remove the smallest amount of air pockets that could get between the grains so they could shake it down even more to the bottom. And so then they would press it down, they would shake it, and then they'd find out that there was room on top of the basket for more grain. And then they would have the man pour the grain to the space they created until it ran over. And then they would take their basket and go home with them. There was a different motive for the one whose payment was a basket of grain. <clears throat> the principle here is, is that when we give with the right motive, God says, that's how I will give to you. I won't just throw a little something in your basket, but I will make sure that it is an overflowing blessing. Oh, yes. But what's interesting about this principle is that whatever it is that you give or the area that you give, amen, that's what you get back in return. Amen. If, if you give kindness, what do you receive? Kindness. Amen. If you give forgiveness, what do you receive? Forgiveness. And this is an important principle because we have to understand this, is that our giving is in base on the reward. The giving has to be with the right motive. It's interesting that whenever there's a situation that, amen, it's where you can get something overflowing, isn't it amazing how we go overboard? I think sometimes I go practice golf at a golf range. In a golf range, amen, you go and you, you pay for a basket of golf balls and you go out and you practice. Now, there's some golf ranges, amen, they give you a predetermined amount of balls in a basket. But there's other places they give you a basket, 
and they send you over to the big barrel of balls, and they allow you to fill up the basket as full as you want. What's amazing when that happens, as some people, and, and I used to do this, but what happens, it makes you look like a fool. You, you fill up your basket full of balls, but you can still stack them on top. So you have this little, amen, little mound on top of your basket. And you realize, I can get a whole lot of balls in this basket. The problem is, is getting that basket over to where I'm going to hit the balls. And as you're walking with your clubs and everything, you're doing this balancing act, and what happens is balls begin to fall off. And now you're chasing a little ball around, trying to hold on to your basket of balls, and you look like an idiot. You look like someone who was trying to get more than what you paid for. What happens is I have learned if it falls off, it falls off, oh well. That's the overflow. The overflow is for somebody else. Whoever picks it up, they can have it. Hallelujah. Okay, that one didn't move you too much. But this one will. The all-you-can-eat buffet. It's amazing that when you are going to be able to partake in food, amen, and there is no limitation on the amount of food that you can put on your plate, or for some of you, plates, you will pile up so much food on your two and three plates that there's no possible way you can finish it all, but since you paid for all you can eat, you're going to make sure that there is overflow on your plates. Now I can tell you this, every time I've gone to a restaurant, that's not all you can eat. Every time I've had a meal there, I always leave feeling full. I always say, I'm leaving room for dessert this time, and there's never room for dessert. But, but because it was all you can eat, we load up. And, it's, and, don't, and don't let them, amen, have crab on the buffet. You'll walk in and you'll see this mound of crab legs and you, you can't even see the person behind it, amen. And they're just breaking crabs and eating crab, breaking crab, and they got this big mound on their table. That's called an overflow. What God is trying to show you is that when you give, I will reward you like that. I'll give you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Mm. But the question comes up, Lord, I've been giving. I've been faithful in my giving, but how come I'm not receiving the reward? And here's what the Lord showed me. He says, because of our motivation for giving. You see, even though God will give us a reward for giving, the motive can't be the reward. Mm. We need to be excited about giving because of what God gave us. You see, here we were, we were bankrupt, amen, headed for hell, amen, full of sin and no way out on our own. Nothing of our self-righteousness could get us out of our sin problem. So what God did is he gave himself. He sent himself to this world in the form of flesh, amen, as the son of God, Jesus Christ, and he gave his life, amen, sinless blood to die on the cross so that you and me could be saved, amen. He gave his very all. He lowered his himself to become man his very own creation to die for us our God is a giving God so what God says I want your response to me is is to give because I have given to you uh, the gospel then should be amen the motivation for why I want to give not the reward in other words, if we're giving to receive the reward, we're giving with the wrong motive. Mm. It is so powerful, this principle, because it's amazing how so much of us are deficient in so many things. And yet, guess what? It's right here in the house. There are people, amen, in the house of God that have a gaping hole in their soul to want to be loved, 
They didn't get love, amen, as a child, or the love they get wasn't sufficient, but it might have been all your mom or your father or anyone in your family had to give, but it wasn't enough because someone hurt them too. And now you have this gaping gap, hole, amen, and God put you in an environment where he operates and there's people around you who will love you. The question is, is the person around you that can love you, will he love you? And God is trying to motivate us to say, look how much I loved you when you were in all your mess and will you receive my love and then take that same love and give it to somebody else. Now, if that is your motivation, then he says, I'll give you love back. Amen. Good measure. Press down, shaking together and running over. Ah. See, God wants us to catch the vision of giving, not the vision of getting. Mm. This is why it's so important to check your motive for giving. Though God will bless you more and more and more and more for your giving, amen, he wants to make sure that you're giving with the right motive. Now, God knows our hearts. And here's what God knows. He knows what we'll really do. I know you say, that if God bless you where you're overflowing and don't know what to do with it, I know what you say you would do. But God really knows the heart. You see, the problem is, is that we can actually trick ourselves. Proverbs 16 and 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. I'm sure if I asked you all here that, hey, amen, if you received that check in the mail from the sweepstakes, hey, amen, and you got $5 million coming, and I asked you, I want you to go ahead and testify, what would you do with that $5 million? People would say, well, first thing I'd do is I'd give my tithes. And then I might even give a little more offering to the Lord. And then what kicks in is, what would I do with this? And we think about, well, it'd be nice to have a bigger house. I'd have to furnish that house. It'd be nice to drive a new car. It'd be nice to go see some places in the world and go on vacation. Hey, Amen. I need to write a resignation letter to my job. Don't need them anymore. Hey, Amen. You see, what happens is eventually we turn. We think because we have given to the Lord that everything's good now, but a real motive is, God, you just gave me $5 million. Now, Lord, what do you want me to do with the whole $5 million? Mm. And if God says, I want you to give it all away, or if God says, I want you to give 90 and you keep 10, could you do that? You see, because God knows how to check the motive. You see, doing the bare minimum God requires isn't enough. Yes, that is a concept under the law, but in this day and age, in this dispensation, we are to exceed the law. We are to do what God, amen, has asked us to do, but not because he is asking us or telling us, but because we love God. The motive has to be understanding that I give because God gave to me so much. Amen. This is kind of a continuation of the message from last week. But what it is is this, is that my response to God's goodness in my life and all he has given me is to give back. Because quite frankly, we all live like millionaires anyway. Amen. If you have a place tonight, amen, that has a roof over your head and got a little heat, you're living better than 70% of the population of the whole world. If you have food on and you're going to have a meal today, some of you are going to have two, some of you are going to have three, some of you are going to have more than you need. Amen. That means you're blessed. You're, 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 already, li you're already blessed. Amen. If you got a vehicle or transportation to get you from point A to point B, it may not be the newest thing, but when I turn the key, it starts, and it gets me where I want to go. That's the basics. That's all you really need. It is a blessing from God. You see, we, 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 we're not thankful.
thankful for what we have when we realize, look how blessed I am to have everything that I have. But what gets in the way is the wrong heart, the wrong motive. Hmm. James takes it another step further. James 4 and 3, he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Woo! Why do you need $5 million? Really? Why do you need $5 million? You see, if the thing that comes to your mind is so that life can be easier and life can be more fun, it's the wrong motive. We have to make sure then that we don't allow our motives, amen, to get in the way of true giving to God. To truly please God and operate with this kingdom principle means, amen, that we have to give with the right heart of motivation. And Jesus really breaks this down, amen, in this scripture text. So let's take it up a little further. Let's go to Luke 6, amen, in verse 30. Because now it's really going to get tough. He says in verse 30, Give to every man that asks of thee, and of him that taketh away your goods, ask them not again. Woo. First of all, notice how he starts that. He says, give to everyone who asks you. Mm. Now, what happens if you see a man there as you're going into Starbucks? Amen. And you know he looks like he's homeless. And his whiskey bottle is empty. And he asks you for some money so he can get something to eat. What do we normally do? We judge the situation. Now, we're good, amen. We're good as religious folks. We like to call them applying the wisdom of God to the circumstance. But we don't really know if he's hungry or if he's going to get another drink. But notice that God says, give to every man that asks of thee. He doesn't say check their motives. He doesn't say to judge them. He doesn't say to question them. He doesn't say to lecture them. He says if you are asked to give to him, and of him that taketh away your goods, ask them not again. Amen. If someone takes something from you, he says let them have it. Don't demand it back. Ah. Do you feel that in your heart? Woo, verse 31, and as you would that men should do to you, do also to them likewise. What if it was you on the corner, sleeping outside all night long? We don't know why he's homeless. We don't know why the situation. We don't know how he got there. We don't know how many people did him wrong. But here you are dressed for church. Amen. Going in to get a cup of coffee before you come into the house of the Lord. And you're going to judge a situation that you have no knowledge about. Except that you know he's homeless and he's got a drinking problem. Amen. And you're going to judge and not give him a little bit of money so he can buy a sandwich. Ah. What if that was you in that situation? You see how we judge? We even give with the wrong motive. But Jesus wasn't through there. He said in verse 32, But if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. There are people who don't know God. There are people, amen, that are living a life of sin, but yet they still have the ability to love somebody else. And he said, so if someone, amen, that doesn't know God, they're sinners, amen, but they show love to somebody, then what is a big deal if you show love to somebody? You're not doing anything different than a sinner would do. How do we show the world then that we are true Christians, that we are Christ-like? It means our giving has to be above even how the sinner gives.
how the sinner loves. It's amazing, a tragedy can happen on TV or in something, and immediately people will rally around a cause and raise money, amen, and, and create a run or a walk or a telethon or something like that, and they don't even know God. They have love and compassion for a situation, but their heart is far from God. Then how much more should we, amen, who have received freely from God, should give above what the sinner gives? Ooh, I know this is getting hard. Verse 33, and if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. You know, we think we're really something when we do good. When we help somebody, we think, oh, man, see, I'm just like Jesus. But guess what? There are people out there that don't know Jesus that are also doing good. They're doing good. They're helping. They're trying to do their best to make this world a better place. And so God says, when we do what the world does, what thank have you? That's nothing. In other words, is, is, is the parameter of our love and giving to someone based on the world? Or is it based on what God gave us? There's the difference. The measuring stick is God's giving to us, not what the world already gives. Verse 34, and if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners... To receive as much again. You know, it's amazing how, amen, you, you will lend money for someone who asks, amen, that doesn't even know God, but you know this, you know they're going to get you your money back. But there are certain saints that are coming your way asking for money, and you know that money's gone. Even with good intent, they may say, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get back to you, don't worry. I'm going to pay you back. Amen. I got a check coming, amen, on the 15th of next month, amen. And then what happens? They stop coming to church. But notice what he says. Even sinners know who to lend money to. Sinners lend money to sinners. Isn't it amazing that there is, amen, a, a bond among sinners, even out in the street, that is stronger than what's in the house of God? Two guys on the street. They say they got each other's back. One of them's a little low on cash. He goes to his buddy and said, hey, man, I need you to break me off a 50. Amen. He knows what he does. He knows he's pushing drugs. He knows he's hustling. He's knowing all that. But he knows this. If he don't end up in jail, he's going to get his 50 back. He knows this, that, that his bond is his word. This is a sinner, someone who doesn't know God, amen, but he knows he can trust his word, and he's a sinner just like him, but he'll break him off of 50 because he knows he'll get it back. But how much more are we to give? Amen. Not expecting anything in return because we know when we give, God has our back. Ah, there's a difference. But if that's not enough for you, Jesus said in verse 35, but love your enemies. Woo! You mean I can't pick and choose? Love your enemies and do good and land and land, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He says, God is showing me, you know what we do? We give, amen, under the same rules and guidelines that sinners give to each other. But he says, I want you to give the way I give. God is saying, church of God, give the way he has given to us. 
because there was a time when you and I were a sinner. But God still gave us mercy every single morning. God still gave you breath in your lungs every day. God allowed that bullet to miss your head. God allowed that drug to get out of your system before it stopped your heart. God had mercy on us when we were far from God. He still gave us love, grace, and mercy, and kindness until we came to a place of repentance. He says, now you give the same way. Hallelujah. Give expecting nothing in return because he said, I'm your daddy. I got everything. You can't get anything from people. God says, I got it all. Man. So to take love and giving to a level that is above the world standard, he says, you got to love your enemies do good to them lend to them without expecting to get anything back but he says this your reward will be great and you will be the children of the most high because God he is good and merciful and kind even to the ungrateful and the wicked hallelujah he loves everybody trying to bring them in. Amen. He'll pour out his love on anybody trying to win them. Hallelujah. How do we show, amen, what our God is like if we give like the world gives instead of giving the way God gives? You see, here's a side we don't see. When we bless people, knowing we're not going to get anything in return, you know they're lying to you. You almost feel like saying, man, don't lie to me. You know you ain't paying me back. But here's what happens when you're not running them down, staring them down. Amen. Look at them up and down. Amen. When you really just let it go, amen, you will forget that you blessed them. But they haven't forgotten because God touches their heart and say, look at what love looks like. He's not trying to run you down. He's not trying. He still treats you the same way. He still loves you. She's still taking care of you. She's still providing for you. Amen. She will lend to you again. That shows the love of God. Hallelujah. So what does he say? He says, give to every man that asks. When Jesus came down on this earth, what did he do? He gave and he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave. He was tired in his body, but he gave. If they wanted healing, he healed them. If they needed deliverance, he delivered them. If they needed their dead raised, he raised their dead. All he did was give, 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 give. We are to give. The same way. Can we be givers with reckless abandon? Woo! Can we, can we give, amen, and be examples of the goodness of God? Mm. I know this is, this is stretching your paradigm. Amen. It does do that. And, and it's amazing how, amen, you realize, you don't think, well, that's not me. I'm a, I give people. I help. But it's amazing sometimes the fight that has to happen in us to give. Remember last Sunday, amen, I preached a message, amen, what's our response to God's love and talking about loving one another and amen, right after service, amen, someone came to me and my wife, amen, and said they need a little bit of cash. No problem, amen, but I don't have any cash on me. Well, that's fine, we can follow you to the bank. Okay, let's go. So, amen. So we drove, amen, and they followed us to the ATM, amen, amen, got out, broke them off what they needed, amen, and me and my wife were driving down the street and said, honey, what are we going to eat? I don't know. I didn't cook anything. Okay, let's go get something. So let's come back over here to Lemon Grove, amen, and amen, get some roasted chicken, amen, with some hot rice and beans and some tortillas, and we'll go home and enjoy our meal. Amen. And so I'm in there, and I order, and I'm waiting. And as I come out with my two baskets, oh, it was smelling so good. Amen. The aroma was coming up on me. Amen. And these three guys come across. I think they just came from the trolley. Young men. Amen. Looked like they could work. And he says, hey, man, you got a quarter? I just gave, right? The fight that goes on within you. I already, I just gave. <laughs> but, it, it, and see, it's not really the money. It's the principle. Man, the car 
Mars is right there. I almost made it. <laughs> Put it down, reached in my pocket, realized I had a pocket full of change. <sighs> Looking at, and, and immediately you want to judge the situation. Now, these three men, they could be working. They look good. They strong. They ran across the street from the trolley. I pulled out all the change I had, and I looked, and there was a lot of quarters in there. And then the Lord convicted me about the message I just preached half an hour before that. And I said, God bless you, man. I said, God bless you. And he looked at that. He said, thank you. He was expecting me to pull out a quarter and give it to him. But I gave him all the change, and it was just pocket change. No big deal, right? I gave it to him. But here's the part that excited me. As I got in the car, amen, and sat down, his two buddies ran ahead of him. They, 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 amen, that, obviously they had too much pride to ask for money, but this guy didn't. And he calls him back. He said, hey, man, he got all excited about the handful of change he had, and here's what he did. A sinner, amen, this is what he did. He took half the change he had and he gave it to his friend. And God showed me, you see how the world is? They have each other's back, but I got to fight through you to just give up some pocket change. Mm. You see, God gives freely. He gives to us on our good days and on our bad days. God still doesn't hold back his great love for you, his mercy for you, his blessings for you. You know we receive stuff we don't deserve, but God loves us. And he says, child of God, show the world what God looks like and give the way God gives. That's the revelation of giving. The revelation of giving is I don't have anything anyway. It all belongs to God. And if I give it, God's going to take care of me. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I found out that someone had a need for a computer. Amen. And I had a computer. I had a little mini laptop that I had been using. Amen. But it wasn't keeping up with my needs. It was too slow. I originally bought it, amen. I just want a little mini so I could type my notes for my sermons, amen. But as I began to study more and more, I needed multiple web pages, and amen. It just wasn't fast enough. So I said, I got to get me a new computer. You know how we are, and we justify it because it's for the Lord, so I got to have it. <laughs> so I was able to get this brand new computer, but I had this little computer, and here it was. It was, it was sitting amen, on my end table, by my bed, and it's just sitting there doing nothing, nothing at all. In fact, it's where I hooked up, amen, every night, charged my phone, and I would sit it right on it. It became, amen, the pad to put my phone on. But it wasn't being used. And I realized that someone had a need, but you know what the first thought was? But that's my computer. But here someone has a need that doesn't have anything, amen, and here I am, amen, with a computer, and it's just sitting there collecting dust, doing nothing, but what came out of my flesh was, but that's my computer. I decided that I was going to give it, amen, and, and the person was so appreciative, amen, because they didn't have anything. And here I, I gave it, and, and I can tell you, the feeling that I got, amen, was so awesome that, amen, how much stuff do we have around here that we don't use that people need? I ask you, how much stuff you got? And you know God gave it to you, but amen, maybe it was he just gave it to you for a time, but now it's time for you to pass, amen, pass it on to somebody else, amen, because that's what God does. He gives. Amen. I began to think, amen, of all this stuff. So, amen. I've been reading, amen, about this church in Texas. Amen. They're giving like crazy, and God is just blessing them and blessing them and blessing them. And I'm saying, God, how, how can we have that in our church? And he says, you do it by giving. But what kicked it off for him is the pastor gave away his car. Ooh, I don't know, Lord, I need my car. 
It might be 10 years old, but I need, I need a car. But the Lord pressing my spirit, amen, in first service. Give that car away. So I put it out there. We'll be giving that car away. Now someone already asked for it, so sorry, second service, you're too late. Amen. <laughs> and I'm going to pray about it, amen, and make sure it's the right situation. But, but, but God is saying, amen, we read it. We talk about it, amen, and we give an extra dollar in the offering. But he says, that's not it. He says, I want a lifestyle that represents me, and you do that by giving. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the revelation of giving. So the motive is giving, amen, because God, you have given us so much. Not because I can get something. Not because I can get a reward. Amen. What God gives you, it just brings you greater responsibility. When he gives you something that is in good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, you know what the responsibility is now? God, what do you want me to do with this? Because I know now it's not about me. You're giving it to me to be a blessing to somebody else. That's the revelation of giving. The revelation of giving is so that we can be a representation of Jesus Christ to the world above how the sinner already gives. Amen. It's so important for us to have then the right heart. I'm closing with this scripture, 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. Every man, according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. In other words, if you got to be beaten, talked down on, or tackled <laughs> to give your tithes and offerings, God is saying, keep it. You receive your blessing because you're giving with the wrong motive. If you're constantly, amen, judging at offering time, amen, and why they got to do this, and why they got to always talk, and why they got to say that, keep your money. Keep it. If we got to do gimmicks and everything else for you to be a giver, amen, God says, amen, I want and I love a cheerful giver. I love someone who understands how good I've been to them. Amen. And the reason they have something to give is because I bless them. I want a cheerful giver. God says, I love a cheerful giver. Hallelujah. Not grudgingly. Amen. Not of necessity. Even Paul, when he made his petition to other churches to help the church of Jerusalem, amen, he just simply asked, but he didn't try and pry and play games, amen, and all that stuff that some churches do. It's not pleasing to God. If God has to twist your arm to get something out of you, God's saying, keep it. But when you really realize how good God has been to you and how much he has given you, Saved and unsaved, you will have no problem being a giver for God. That's the revelation of giving. Hallelujah. Stand with me if you will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so awesome. There is a response that we need to have to his love. And there is a response that we need to have to his giving to us. Yes, we'll attest your faith, of course. Amen. We'll attest your courage, of course. But I can guarantee you if you give for the right motive to be a blessing to someone, to be an example to someone of the love of God, God will bless you. This is why God adds rewards, especially in this area of giving. He's trying to get us there. He's trying to get us to understand, not, not to do it for rewards, but to understand, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. God is saying, I will bless you. I'll bless you with more because once you push past that threshold, he knows now he can trust you with more. He knows now that you will be a representation of him so he can give you more because you will represent him properly. God is trying to set all of us up to be true ambassadors of Christ in giving. He wants us to be blessed, but, but not so we can just say we're blessed and say we travel the world. Amen. 
but to be a blessing to someone else who maybe hasn't seen, amen, their parents ever, and they're on the other side of the world. You go. Let me bless you to go. You have a real need. And they will say, wow, who is the God you serve? Who loves like that? Who gives like that? So that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the only reason we have it is because he gave it to me. And so obviously he gave it to me to give to you. What a powerful revelation to give with that kind of heart. To give with the heart of, of God the way he gives to us. This altar is open for you. Perhaps you need to come down and repent or check your heart. If you need salvation today, it's the greatest thing God has given us. The chance to be saved. Amen. That you can go to the greatest thing he gives us, and that's eternal life with him. Amen. We will pray for you. We will baptize you. We will pray for you to receive the Holy Ghost. Whatever your need is today, God has it. But this altar is available for you now. Amen. Come on down.